without further ado, let me introduce our very first speaker, Dr. Chan Kim Ming. Dr. Chan was one of the pioneers who started the first department of geriatrics medicine in Singapore in 1989 in Tantor Singh Hospital. Since then, he had headed several geriatrics department at Alexandra Hospital and Changi General Hospital. In 2014, he was appointed by the United Nations as their geriatric specialist to access fitness for thrall of senior Khmer Rouge leaders in Cambodia. Dr. Chan now runs, to, uh, runs his own private practice under Chan KM Geriatrics and Medical Clinic, both in Glen Eagles and Mouth Avenue Hospital. Dr. Chance will be sharing with us on a topic, don't forget to remember. Dr. Chan, please. Hi, uh, thanks Jenny for your kind introduction. <laughs> and uh, thank you also for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Now, looking at the poll questions, uh, I think my talk would be able to answer the two uh, most popular questions as to uh, what are the dementia effects on the person as well as how to prevent and or delay uh, dementia. And I hope uh, you would stay with me throughout the whole duration of my talk. Uh, I also want to thank Andrea for helping me with the slides to share the slides so that I'll be able to concentrate on uh, presenting this talk. Now, I, I wanted to use the title of a very popular song uh, written and sung by the Bee Gees, and it is called Don't Forget to Remember. And I do not know how many of you have actually heard this song. Uh, if you do, then you are probably around my vintage. This song was actually recorded in 1969 when I was 10 years old. So if uh, we find that this problem of forgetfulness is something that is extremely, or is getting increasing traction, uh, as I see more and more patients coming to consult with me because either they themselves or their loved ones are getting more and more forgetful. Uh, the next slide will give you a brief summary of uh, what dementia is. Now, dementia basically is a condition where the person loses memory. Uh, not this one, the, the one earlier. The earlier slide, please. Dementia is a condition where the person loses memory and, and the loss of memory is basically the earliest sign uh, of uh, someone who is who may be dementing. So sometimes we use the word dementing as a condition where the person started to lose uh, their memory and then later on their thinking, their reasoning skills, uh, and it has to be to the extent of interfering with his uh, daily life and activities. Now we find that. From this rough definition, uh, the loss of pure memory alone does not make one uh, to have dementia. There must be other parts of the brain and other domains of their cognitive function that is affected. In addition to their loss of memory that qualifies the person to uh, have this uh, definition of having uh, dementia. And as a result of the dementia, where the brain functions gradually deteriorate, obviously they would lose control of their body systems, like their urinary system, their motion, sometimes even their inability to walk, to eat, or to swallow, or to lose control of their emotions, and they become easily agitated or angry. And sometimes their thoughts might be uh, affected and they can become very paranoid against a person or they may have delusions that people are trying to steal their things or cheat them and so forth. Uh, now, before I move further on, I'd like to just clarify a few terminology because 
this is a very common question that families would come uh, and ask me. They will say that my mother has Alzheimer's disease, so does she have dementia? Or they may ask me, so what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease, for example? Now, dementia is like a broad general umbrella term to describe someone with this definition, as you see in the slide. But Alzheimer's disease will be a bit more specific because it is the cause of the dementia. So for example, if we have a fever, then it is just a symptom. But what is the cause of the fever? Is it a COVID infection? Or is it a simple flu? Or is it a pneumonia, a chest infection, and so forth? So dementia is that broad general term, while Alzheimer's disease, for example, would be the cause of the dementia. So that would be the true diagnosis. Now, in my next slide, uh, I'll actually be showing you uh, the types of dementia that we have. Uh, of course, the most common would be Alzheimer's disease, uh, especially in uh, Western population, in the Caucasian population. Uh, locally, they say that vascular dementia is more common because there are more strokes locally, more yeah. hyperpressure, uh, diabetes, uh, cholesterol problems, and so forth. Uh, then there are other types of dementia that are linked with Parkinson's disease. We call it Parkinson's disease dementia. Uh, rarer, we have Lewy bodies dementia, frontal lobe dementia, and, and sometimes it's not possible for us to identify uh, which specific uh, cause of the dementia, and it is just a mixed bag. They have a bit of everything, and so we call it a mixed dementia. And of course, we should not forget the presence of alcoholic dementia among those who drinks a lot of alcohol and they are drunk all the time. And when they grow older, then they can also develop dementia as a result of their alcoholic behavior. Now, how do we actually decide which type of dementia, you know, out of so many, which types of dementia are we dealing with? That's why when we present with symptoms that are suggestive of dementia, then your doctor would need to do some blood tests uh, to identify whether there are specific um, deficiencies, for example, in your body that is contributing to this loss of memory. And more importantly, we need to do scans, you know, brain scans. It can be as simple as a CT scan or a bit more complex, the MRI, a bit more specific, like the PET scan or even the amyloid PET scan, if you really want to uh, check whether the person has Alzheimer's disease uh, or not. Okay, so in my next slide, uh, we, we talk about uh, the different causes. Uh, broadly speaking, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lewy bodies, frontal lobe, this comes under degenerative causes. And so if it is a degeneration of the brain, then your blood test basically will be normal. Right? But your scans will show the shrinkage of the brain and will show different lobes of the brain that may be more shrunken than other parts of the brain. So in vascular cause, we call it vascular dementia and they are usually stroke related if they, are, if they involve bigger blood vessels or if they involve the smaller capillaries, then they are known as the microvascular ischemic disease. And in this cause of dementia, they usually have maybe some diabetes, so sugars may be high. Uh, they may have um, high cholesterol, you know, or they may have some kidney involvement because of hyperpressure and, and, and so forth. So that is how we help to differentiate between the two. And there's another group called normal pressure hydrocephalus, where there is a lot of excessive water in the brain. The, the, the brain is basically bathed with uh, cerebral spinal fluid. And, and as the body produces cerebral spinal fluid, some of the fluid will get reabsorbed back by the body. And if they are not reabsorbed, 
then there will be accumulation causing pressure built up in the brain, causing shrinkage of the brain, and we call this normal pressure hydrocephalus. Now, repeated trauma, like the boxers, for example, you know, like the footballers, for example, those who specialize in haters, you know, so if you love to play football, then please don't hate the ball because it is going to cause a lot of concussion, minor concussions on your brain. And when you grow older, then that could be a cause of dementia as well. And those with repeated falls with head injuries or infections, for example, uh, meningitis, encephalitis, uh, and perhaps you may uh, think of a mad cow disease, right? Mad cow disease is an infection uh, found in cows. And if we happen to take the infected meat, it gets assumed, consumed into our body, and it gets into the brain. And this virus is a very slow growing virus. It takes maybe 10 years, 20 years before it manifests itself with a softening of the brain. And then the person develops dementia as a result of this slow virus infection. And of course, we mentioned earlier about alcohol, which is a toxin, a toxic substance to the brain. And of course, those who are taking drugs, because a lot of uh, this kind of uh, uh, lifestyle drugs, for example, will affect the brain uh, in times to come. Okay, so uh, how do we identify if the person has dementia? Firstly, forgetfulness is the most common presentation. After forgetfulness, then they may develop language difficulties. They may have word finding difficulties and names difficulties. So when they speak, they speak in a rather slow manner, pausing to think what is the next word to use and how to express themselves. And sometimes they can't remember the name and therefore they would have to use sentences to describe. Uh, for example, uh, if they want to talk about their spectacles, uh, where, have you seen my spectacles? And they can't pull that name out, right? So they will say, no, have, have you come across the thing that I put over my eye so that I can see clearly, for example. Huh? So these are word finding difficulties. Mm. Uh, someone may also become disorientated to time, you know, so they have a nap in the afternoon. When they wake up, they think it is morning. And so they brush their teeth and they want to go out to work. Or they may be disorientated to persons. They might think that the husband is the brother or the wife is the sister, you know, uh, and they may be disorientated to place. So these people, maybe they may be at home, but they would be asking, when are we going home? come bring me home now, but they are actually in their own home and they can't recognize their home. So there is this orientation to place. And of course, another presentation of such a person would be that when they go to uh, a, even a familiar or unfamiliar place, they may get lost and may not be able to find their way uh, home again. They may have mood disturbance. Sometimes they get angry for no reason. They get uh, happy and laugh for no good reason. They may have sleep disturbance. Uh, they can't sleep. They wake up at 3 a.m. After that, they wander around the house. They pack and unpack their cupboards. You know, they, they change, they bathe, they ask for breakfast at 3 a.m. So these are things that may happen during the times when they are having sleep disturbance. And of course, in a bit more severe cases, then their day may not be a 24-hour day like yours and mine. They may have a 48 hour day. So they will be awake for 48 hours and then they will sleep for 48 hours, awake for the eight hours, sleep for 48 hours. And quite commonly, I see in some of my patients, they have a 72 hour day. So three days, very alert, and then three days sleeping. And then they wake up and the next three days, they are alert again. And personality changes are the ones that usually break the person, the family's hearts, because they would come and say that my, uh, my mom is no longer the same mother that I had because she used to love us, but now she just scream, shout, and curses all of us. And also there are personality changes that can uh, affect the person developing dementia. 
Now, how, how are these stages of cognitive decline comes about? Firstly, they may have subjective memory loss. They will come and say, yeah, I think my memory is not so good. But when you test them, they, they score 100%. They are, they are fine. So basically, they are normal when we test them. But somehow, they feel that they are not as sharp, they are not as good as they were before. So these are so-called subjective memory loss. And then they may move on and to the stage before developing dementia, we call it the prodromal dementia, where yeah, they are still cognitively normal, but the scan already starts showing changes in their brain. For example, if we do uh, an MRI scan, certain part of the brain called the hippocampus may start to shrink with Alzheimer's disease, but it, it started to shrink even before the symptoms of dementia sets in. And if we want to look at even more specific, like amyloid PET scans, they might even be able to predict that in five, 10 years later, this person is going to develop Alzheimer's disease. You know, so, so these are some of the tools, the biomarkers that we have that can help us to identify very, very early onset uh, dementia. And then it progresses to what we call mild cognitive impairment. They may be a bit more forgetful than before. They may have slight difficulties concentrating in their work. They may be able to multitask previously, but now they can't. They only do one thing at a time. So there's a bit of reduced work performance because there may be lapses of memory, forget a bit of this, forget a bit of that, difficulty with name, but overall they are still very much independent. They can look after themselves very well. They can cook a meal. They can handle their own medications. They can uh, you know, go and see the doctor. They can go to the hairdressers and so forth. The so-called instrumental activities of daily living or IADL. So these are higher activities of daily living. And they are able, they are capable of doing all that. But when you test them, their cognitive scores uh, don't do too well. Okay, And then, of course, from the mild cognitive impairment stage, maybe over the next two to three years, they may slide into the early dementia where, of course, the forgetfulness, concentration, all this got a bit more worse. They need a bit more help with their ADLs and their IADLs. They have some problem managing their finances. Uh, they Socially, they get a bit more withdrawn, but they are still able to cope by themselves at home. Uh, you know, so these are the early dementia uh, stages. And usually it is at this stage that uh, families you know, maybe one third of the families would identify that hey, they, are, they are no longer as sharp as they used to, and therefore they are brought uh, to see a doctor. Now, at the next stage, the next slide, right, then they become moderate, uh, where memory loss is more prominent, more help is needed to function at home, and they start to forget their addresses and their phone numbers, okay, and they may not know the time of the day the date or dates or where they live and they have problem making decisions. And one of the most uh, common telltale signs is that they start to resist personal hygiene. You know, they don't like to bathe. When they do force them to bathe, they will wear back their old dirty baju, you know, their clothes. Uh, they don't like to, to change their clothes and uh, we really do not know why this is so prominent, but we almost always see this happening uh, in many of our patients by the time they reach this stage of moderate dementia. And of course, some of them will begin to get incontinent, you know, urine, you know, a bit slow, they start wetting, soiling themselves, wetting the bed, you know, bowels, again, soiling their pants. And they have what we call sundowning syndrome. Now, early morning and afternoon, they are quite normal, but maybe from five o'clock, six o'clock onwards, when the sun starts to go down, when it is not so bright outside, there's less activities, 
at home because everyone comes home, you know, winding down to, to go to bed. Uh, that's where they become, their behavior becomes more agitated, more paranoid, and, you know, uh, more aggressive. They may be shouting, scolding for no reason. They may be accusing people of things that they never do uh, and things like that. So daytime, quite normal. But towards the evening, they start to show this abnormal behavior. That's why we call it sun downing. So when the sun goes down, that is where this behavior comes up. And they also, at the stage of moderate dementia, they would also start having sleep disturbances. And then it moves on to the severe dementia stage. Of course, with each stage, more assistance is needed and they start to forget names of close relatives, but they will still be able to remember their own name, but maybe not the names of their children, maybe not the name of their spouse. Uh, they may have difficulty counting, you know, simple thing, one to 10, uh, become more incontinent, reduce ability to speak, more behavioral changes like delusions, anxiety, agitation, more sleep weight disturbance, and then they have this day and night uh, inversion. That means daytime they'll be sleeping, at nighttime they'll wake up and, and uh, go and look for people, look for things to eat, look for things to do. And, and that becomes a bit of a major issue because their, their children perhaps perhaps will be coming home and they'll be tired from a day's work and they want to rest. And then the elderly, you know, grandma will be walking up and down, you know, uh, opening, closing doors or locking things up and, and things like that. So, so this can happen when it reaches the stage of severe dementia. And finally, in the late stage or terminal stage, then of course, everything shuts down. They become immobile, they become bedridden, uh, maybe even totally incontinent. They may have forgotten how to swallow and they may need tube feeding. Their limbs become very stiff or even contracted. And because of their lying in bed and refusal to bathe and change, they may develop bed sores. And of course, in extreme cases, they exhibit what we call mutism. So they appear like mute, they just don't talk or they cannot talk. Now, from these stages of mild to moderate to severe, uh, as a general rule, we say it is three years, three years, three years, right? From the time they enter into uh, mild dementia, usually that phase lasts about three years without treatment. And then after at the end of three years or so, they will slide into moderate dementia, another three years, and then become severe dementia, another three years. So from the time of uh, diagnosis, usually uh, uh, from the mild dementia to the stage of severe or even terminal dementia, then we are really looking at a duration of about 10 years. Okay, but of course treatment will stretch each of these stages you know, by about one and a half to two years. So you have a longer runway, you know, before you end up reaching the final or the terminal stage. And patients with such severe dementia will usually pass away because of some lung infection, urine infection, bed sores. These are the usual cause of uh, demise of a person with, uh, in that stage of dementia. Now, so this is the first part of my talk. Now, the second part is probably the 80 plus persons who have opted to say that that is what they want to learn from this talk, and that is prevention. Okay. Now, if we look at this whole um, duration of dementia, how it progresses, and in what way does it cause uh, the afflict the person, then you will realize that, yeah, it's actually prevention is very important, isn't it? Now, one of the questions that people always come and ask is that, oh, my, my great-grandfather has dementia and now I'm getting forgetful 
uh, you know, if my chance is very high, will I get it? Is it genetic? Well, we know that there are definitely certain genes and certainly it's more than this APOE4 gene. There are a lot more genes that are associated with dementia, but there are also a lot of genes that are protective against dementia. So what we are able to, to discover now are some of the genes, right? And we know that genes alone play a small part in developing dementia. So environmental and lifestyle plays a very big part in whether the gene expresses itself or not. Okay, so you may have the genes, you may have the, uh, the, 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 the genes that uh, allow you to develop, that makes you develop dementia, but it, you also need the lifestyle and you also need the environment to cause that gene to show itself up, you know? So that is important for us to know. Otherwise, if, if uh, everything is so genetic about dementia, then what prevention are we talking about, right? Because we cannot change our genes. We have not reached the stage of gene therapy yet for dementia. So first and foremost, we find that by the time maybe we reach 40, 50, 60 years old, many of us would have some common chronic medical conditions. And that would be like high blood pressure, diabetes, and cholesterol. Now, these conditions must be well controlled first, especially if you're talking about vascular dementia, which is related to developing strokes, or which is caused by strokes, as well as caused by small vessel disease. So no point, you are wasting time and money if you want to prevent vascular dementia and your blood pressure is haywire, your diabetes is upside down and your cholesterol is sky high, bound to fail. So the first and foremost, your underlying chronic condition must be well controlled first, okay? And therefore, to make sure that your underlying health is good and they are controlled, then we need to have regular health checks because there are many medical conditions in the elderly are silent. For example, deficiencies in vitamin B12, some cases of even hyper or hypothyroidism, they may be silent and they may just show up as forgetfulness. The rest of the healthy lifestyle that the Ministry of Health has been preaching day in, day out, is still very important in the prevention of dementia quitting or reducing smoking, weight control, low sugar, low salt intake, you know, and low to moderate alcohol consumption. Very important because if you remember earlier, alcohol is toxic to the brain, okay? Although some of you may think that, yeah, wine is good for the heart, but of course, excessive consumption will mean that there will be a toxicity effect on the brain. And of course, by the time we are, Worrying about uh, developing dementia, we would also perhaps be at the retirement age. So you cannot retire suddenly. You, know, you wake up one day and say, hey, today I don't have to go to work. And so it is tomorrow and the day after and the day after. Then what are you going to do with your life? Right? You're not going to uh, sit at home doing nothing. You're not going to watch Netflix the rest of your life. So you have to plan your retirement with activities. Next slide, please. So nutrition is very important because I think nutrition would be a very basic thing for us to do. It is not dealing with medications, but it is something that if we take care of it, it will also take care of the rest of our body. You know? And of course, in this particular slide, we talk about nutrition specifically for the brain, like omega-3 fatty acids, like antioxidants, like adequate proteins and amino acids so that the brain cells can repair itself, the, the adequate vitamin B12, folic acid, phospholipids, choline, all these are found in very richly in the brain. So if the brain cells have lack of raw materials, then how can it repair itself and how can it produce uh, chemical uh, in order to allow the impulses to flow from one part of the brain to another, right? So nutrition is important. And 
In general, we advocate four servings of fatty fish a week. And uh, fatty fish will, will give us a lot of fish oils uh, like EHA, DPA, DHA, omega-3s, and so forth. And I, th I think many of us also know that uh, fatty fish is also good for the heart. Uh, in fact, you are right. Anything that is good for the heart is also good for the brain. Because if it is good for the heart, if you do things that are good for the heart, you also reduces your risk of stroke. And therefore, you also reduces the risk of vascular dementia. Now, vegetables are play a very important role, you know, like kale, like spinach, broccoli, Brussels sprout, you know, the so-called, at one time there was the superfood, you know, cauliflower, cherry tomatoes, carrot, pumpkin, they are all laden, beetroots, right? They are all laden with antioxidants. Now, you, you repeatedly hear this term antioxidants huh? because when our body is metabolizing, when our muscles are moving, when our brain is thinking, our heart is beating, there will be wear and tear. And the wear and tear will present itself as uh, a lot of these uh, free radicals. And free radicals are actually charged particles and then they will damage the cell membranes, they will affect the enzyme, they will reduce the efficiency of the cell. And in the end result is that whichever cell it is, muscle, brain, or, or so on, will die, right? And uh, antioxidants are the ones that will mop up all these free radicals. So it prevents cell death, it uh, improves the efficiency and the function of all our cells, including our brain cells. Now, spices also play a very important role because they have their anti-inflammatory, you know, especially the turmeric, the cinnamon, the nutmegs, the cocoa, they have anti-inflammatory properties in addition to antioxidant properties. And one of the uh, causation that has been found to uh, cause this degeneration of the brain, including Alzheimer's, uh, disease or Alzheimer's dementia is that there may be an inflammatory component that is hastening cell death. And therefore, if this is anti-inflammatory, then it is good for the brain. And hence, spices being a natural source of anti-inflammation uh, uh, will be able to achieve that. Beans and legumes, you know, like chickpeas, lentils, beans, rich in vitamins, fibers, iron, magnesium, choline, and they recommend actually intake uh, you know, of half a bowl of these beans you know, twice a week uh, to make up for all these requirements that the brain would require. Next slide. Fruits, yes, they always touted the blueberries, the strawberries, and the raspberries as super berries. You know, especially if they are brightly colored, multicolored, the more colorful they are, the brighter the color is, the more different colors they have, the better. And therefore, we would advise them to take a variety of fruits of different colors. And not forgetting nuts and seeds like walnuts and almond nuts. You know, they have a very rich oil, uh, which are also very healthy for the brain in addition to a lot of uh, trace elements and minerals. And various types of oils are also helpful. Like for example, olive oil. You know, in the Mediterranean diet, for example, they use a lot of olive oil. And they have found that, studies have found that the use of olive oil with lots of monounsaturated fats, vitamin E and antioxidant does help to protect the brain against dementia. Now, lately, there has been a lot of talk about virgin coconut oil. You know, there has been some report, so-and-so drank this coconut oil, you know, 20 meals every day, and then who and below, he, from being someone who is demented, wow, he became so normal, you know. But the overall studies on the use of coconut oil is not very strong. And therefore, I don't think any doctors at this point in time would be a strong advocate that you should be drinking coconut oil because uh, on one hand, they may have very good uh, uh, 
monosaturated uh, triglycerides, which are beneficial, but on the other hand, they are saturated fats and they have, uh, they have a lot of um, uh, other uh, negative health uh, causing uh, effects on the heart as well. You know, so in that, in that sense, for us to get uh, the benefit of the MCT from coconut oil, we really have to consume quite a lot of coconut oil per day. You know, and as a, as a result of this, it may uh, have too, there may be too much saturated fats and therefore it may have an adverse effect on the other parts of our body. So it is not something that we are advocating at this point in time, unless there are more uh, studies showing it up. Red wine, yes, red wine. Everyone knows red wine is good for the heart. But as I say, women, maybe we recommend up to one glass a day, men up to two, but enjoy in moderation because excessive alcohol intake is also toxic. Uh, to the brain as well. Okay, in my next slide, we talk about physical exercise, right? Like Tai Chi, walking, cycling. Now, there are some studies to show that even if we just pedal 10 minutes on a stationary bike uh, and we monitor the brain activity, there is increased activity in the hippocampus. And we know that the hippocampus is that part of the brain that's responsible for short term memory. And so in cycling is helpful. It helps to pump the blood up to the brain and it's especially helpful of, for that matter, physical exercise is especially helpful even for cases of vascular dementia because you are actually pushing blood through the brain even if the capillaries are all very small and tiny, right? Swimming, dancing, learning a new sport. We are talking about, you know, Gen, as a general rule for physical activities, four sessions a week, each lasting 35 to 40 minutes. Okay, next. Now, mental exercises are equally important because if we look at the, the brain as a muscle, then definitely we need to exercise the brain. So word games like crossword puzzle, learning a new language, learning how to play a musical instrument, mahjong, card, learning new skills like photography and even calligraphy and painting and knitting skills that trains the eye hand coordination are helpful uh, means of stimulating the brain. Okay, next. So now someone advocated or there are some studies to advocate other handedness because many of us are right handed. So we do everything we write with our right hand, we brush our teeth with our right hand. So in this practice of other handedness, we are basically trying to force uh, the brain to reorientate ourselves, to use our left hand, to brush our teeth, to use our left hand to write, you know, practice writing. And, and so it is just a matter of, of stressing our brain so that they learn new skills. Huh? So mental exercises could be as simple as trying to go home through another route that you are not very familiar with or doing mental calculations instead of reaching out to your handphone and using the calculator. Uh, when you're going for grocery list, instead of just following the list to buy your grocery, try to memorize it first, and then try to, you know, from, from memory, try to buy whatever you want, and then counter check on your list, right? Attending cooking classes, uh, different tastes, different textures of food is helpful. Uh, drawing a map of the place you just visited. You know, maybe you have just visited Chinatown uh, with your grandchildren. And so your grandchildren may say, oh, come, Ama, come, let's sit down. Where did we go today? And, and where are the places? You know, where, where is Chinatown Point? Uh, where did we go and eat? You know, so you just try from your memory to the place that you went through. You know, where are the places? Uh, this will be helpful as well. And of course, meditation. Being sitting quietly, you know, concentrating on our breathing, trying to think of what we have done the day before, you know, uh, practicing the presence of mind, mindfulness, all these things do help to release stress and also helps uh, with uh, improving the function of the brain. Next, stress reduction. And also social activities like just chit chat, 
having adequate rest and sleep at night, reading, meeting up with friends, as I mentioned earlier, meditation and mindfulness. Next. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, medication, supplements, I think these are the ones that people will try to jump straight to, right? Because it doesn't need you to spend much time. You just go and buy a whole lot of supplements and you swallow them and you think that they will work miracles for you. Uh, there are so many on the market. Some of them are things that I do recommend for some patients when they are found to be suitable. They may be supplements that contain ginseng, they may be supplements that contain ginkgo, uh, biloba, multivitamins, vitamin E, uh, curcumin, omega-3, you know, even drinking coffee has been found three to five cups per day can help with uh, prevention of dementia or even this extract from the periwinkle plant, the wimpositin, has been found to improve blood circulation to the brain. It's a rich antioxidant. So these are some supplements that uh, has been touted as to help prevent dementia. Next. So other anecdotal prevention would include things like influenza vaccination. You know, they found that those who went for influenza vaccination, less of them develops dementia. Maybe because it protects them against influenza, against sickness, and we know that sickness do cause the person uh, the stress and do affect the brain in the long run. Prevention of head injury in midlife, avoidance of air pollution because uh, things that affect the lungs will ultimately affect the oxygenation of our blood, which will ultimately affect our brain. Higher educational level is protective against dementia, hence lifelong learning, lifelong learning, uh, we encourage people to still you know, go for a degree, you know, even after they are retired. Maintaining a normal body mass index, you know, correcting sensory input to, to the brain. For example, if you have cataract, remove it so that you can see clearly. If you've got hearing impairment, put on a hearing aid so that you can hear properly, so that you can have a good chit chat with your friends and family, so that you are not deprived of external stimuli to your brain. And of course, some advocate the use of flicking light, red light, pulsating sounds at 40 hertz, and this is supposed to stimulate the brain and helps to dissolve some of these uh, plaques and scars in the brain. But of course, these are anecdotal and there are no good studies to actually show that they work. So lastly, has it been proven that preventive measures work? Yes, there has been quite a good study between 2009 to 2011 in Finland, it's called the FINGER study. It's a Finnish geriatric intervention study to prevent cognitive impairment and disability. And they show that a multi-domain intervention, meaning that you exercise, you do mental activities, you keep yourself healthy, you, know, uh, you uh, improve your nutrition, you know, you do all the things that I have mentioned in my slides earlier. So that's why it is called multi-domain. They can actually improve or maintain your cognitive function in at-risk elderly people. And of course, we know prevention must start early. So if by the time we reach a moderate dementia, I don't think there's any preventive measures that's going to work. So by the time we start to think our memory is, is deteriorating, you know, I think that will be the time for us to start. Even if the tests are normal, even if you are talking about subjective memory impairment, we should start looking at our healthy lifestyle, eating healthily, stop smoking, drink in moderation, keep regular exercises, keep mentally active and have adequate rest and sleep. I think this is my last slide. Thank you very much for listening to me and I'm open for some questions and answers. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Um, I think it's very, very, you know, um, eye-opening for me. I'm just wondering, you know, for myself, you know, would I be aware if I'm, demand I'm suffering from dementia? Because pretty often I forget, you know, like where I put my keys, you know, I'm like, oh, what day of the week is it today, you know, when I get up? So would it be a sign of early dementia? Well, I, I don't think 
just because we have uh, some of these symptoms, we should jump in to diagnose ourselves as having dementia. Uh, a lot of things do interfere with our uh, memory and our ability to know what day of the week it is, for example. You know, it's because we are working and we have a schedule, so we are able to sort of keep track of the days of the week. But if you are retired or if you are on leave, for example, where there's nothing, uh, no, no more schedules for you to do, then you may have such lapses where you forget what day of the week it is. And if, for example, if you don't sleep well, uh, chronic sleep deprivation, if you are anxious, if you are uh, multitasking a lot, things like this may also uh, cause the person to lose memory. But generally, uh, if someone comes to me and say, doctor, I think I have dementia, I'm happy for that person. Because usually, uh, depending on what type of dementia we are talking about, if you are talking about the degenerative type, they usually do not have insight into their condition. They will be obviously lo losing their way. They'll be obviously very forgetful, but they will say, I'm normal, right? Because they have lost that insight. So they are the ones that are very difficult to treat. They are the ones that will not take the medicine because they say they are normal, right? Then on the other hand, there's also a group like the vascular dementia, they tend to retain their insight. And therefore, they will come and say that, doctor, I think I have, I, I'm getting dementia. And they can become very depressed because they still maintain their insight. So just based on whether uh, you know or you don't know, it becomes very difficult for us to make a guess. So I think even in such a situation, if you find that, yeah, I have adequate rest, I, I'm not unduly stressed, I don't have a lot of things occupying my time, um, uh, you know, causing me to, to be multitasking, and yet I seem to, be, and that other people are complaining about me that I'm forgetful, then I, I think uh, you should go for an assessment rather than self-guessing uh, you know, yourselves. Thank you, Dr. Chan. I've got a question here. Some uh, may phone us, is treatment and medication for different types of dementia the same? Uh, no, they are different. That's why we still need to find out exactly what that cause of dementia is. Uh, some medications for Alzheimer's, for example, are not very effective for vascular dementia. In the same way, treatment for vascular dementia will be quite different for those that are for Alzheimer's. But uh, there are some overlaps. Uh, for example, if the person has behavioral problem, then whether it is uh, this type of dementia or that type of dementia, there is a lot of symptomatic treatment involved. And this symptomatic treatment, for example, in treating the agitation, treating the sleep, uh, tre uh, treating the uh, the disorientation, all that would roughly be about the same type of medications across the board. Okay. Um, any other questions from the floor? Um, I have a next question here is, my husband mostly does not sleep at night, mostly playing game, etc., and only uh, sleep a few hours in the morning. Is he a candidate for dementia? Is there anything I can do, you know? Well, it, it depends because the different people have different sleep requirements, right? Some, some when they sleep, two, three hours is actually adequate for them. And one very rough way of uh, uh, identifying how much sleep they require would be to ask them whether when they wake up in the morning, uh, even if they sleep at 3 a.m. Or, or, and they wake up at 7, for example, whether they feel very tired or they still feel quite refreshed, you know. And if they still feel very refreshed, even though they sleep very late, then that might be an indication that uh, that might be adequate for him. But of course, if the person uh, retains this, this uh, habit, 
for a long period of time, then they may actually over time slowly develop sleep deprivation. And sleep deprivation would definitely affect the function of the brain. And therefore, he would become a candidate uh, as a result. Okay. Um, I think uh, in view of time, um, I would do a last question. Somebody actually asked, Margaret actually asked, what is mindfulness? Okay, mindfulness is just a, is a form of meditation, right? Where you sit down quietly and then you usually close your eyes, you know, in a very restful position. You may be seated on a chair, uh, you know, with your feet sort of firmly on the ground and you are well balanced on the chair and you allow your mind to initially concentrate on your breathing. You know, so this something like meditation now, uh, concentrate on your breathing. And then once you concentrate on your breathing, then you start to think about uh, the activities that you have done maybe this morning or yesterday, you know, in a very calm manner. Uh, it's just to remind yourself of the activities that you have done before uh, without any judgment of how you do it, whether you do it well or you didn't do it well. You know, so you are just mindful of, of yourself, you are mindful of your breathing, you are mindful of the things that uh, you have done. Uh, and just 15, 20 minutes you know, of this exercise, it can, be, it can be done as a solid session or it can be done in between your work as a kind of a rest, as a kind of mental distressing. So, so so basically, this is just what mindfulness is. Thank you, doctor. Uh, I think though I said, you know, uh, last questions, but I saw two very interesting questions. Though, uh, lady, uh, ladies and gentlemen, keep your questions coming. I can ask doctor to answer them offline and reply you. Okay. Um, doctor, one question is, are people with sleep apnea problem at higher risk of dementia? Uh, yes, unfortunately, that's because in sleep apnea, uh, you basically have a uh, low oxygen and high carbon dioxide at night, right? And, and basically the brain needs oxygen and the brain doesn't need carbon dioxide. Huh? So in, in that sense, uh, we do have patients who, because of severe sleep apnea, develop cognitive impairment, some cognitive problem, memory problem. And, uh, and because of that, we strongly advise them to see a, a sleep physician, a sleep doctor, and some of them may require the, the CPAP machine you know, to help them to breathe. And then they will become a lot more uh, awake during the day because they sleep better at night and their oxygenation improve, then their brain function also improve. Okay, um, I will do a last question. Excellent patch prescribed for my mother with early AD for several years, but later she developed rashes and was stopped and changed, you know, um, to oral medicine. May I know um, how Exelon prevent the AD from going downhill? Okay, uh, basically, uh, the, the, the brain functions are always a function of chemical receptors in the brain. Right, the acetylcholine, for example, is a chemical, a neurotransmitter. And there are a lot of enzymes that will break down this acetylcholine. Uh, and, and therefore, in patients with Alzheimer's, for example, they have a shortage of acetylcholine in the brain. Therefore, the neurotransmitter is lacking. And because of that, they have all these problems of memory and so forth. And uh, basically the patch, what the patch does is that uh, they block the breakdown by blocking the enzymes that breaks down acetylcholine. You know? And therefore, because they block the breakdown, there is accumulation of acetylcholine in the brain. Hence, it improves the brain function. And secondly, there are also some studies which shows that in the process of doing that, it also helps to uh, reduce to slow down the shrinkage of the brain and hence it reduces the progression of the condition. 
Um, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Maybe all of you should uh, give Dr. Chan a round of applause for those questions that I did not answer or did not manage to post to Dr. I will send it to him and I will answer you offline. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chan. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be very happy very to continue to, to answer some of the questions through uh, Jenny. Okay. I will email them to you. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Thank you. Okay. Next, uh, before you know, we go on to our next speaker, which is Ms. Shalin Quack, I just want to remind all of you that you know, um, places that you actually can buy Raven Horse Pure Juices would be from NTUC Fair Price, um, Fair Price Finest, Fair Price Extra, Red Mart, Guardian Stores, Guardian Online, Shopee, Lazada, and Yes Natural. Okay. Um, Next, we have uh, Micheline Quack. Micheline Quack is a practicing nutritionist with more than 20 years of industry experience in the government and private sector. Her areas of expertise in public nutrition and community education. Today, she's going to share with us, you know, why uh, beetroot's good for us. Uh, over to you, Micheline. Thank you, Jenny. Let me just share my screen now. Oops. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for spending um, tonight with us. Uh, in the interest of time, I will uh, try to keep my presentation short and I'll be happy to take questions after this. Um, without much uh, delay, let me just share with you a little bit about why beetroot is the best. Um, the World Health Organization has um, recommended um, and endorsed that a healthy diet is protective against malnutrition in all forms, as well as the prevention of chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and cancer. Uh, it is very recognized that 30% um, of chronic conditions can be preventable by our diet. Okay, and so what is a healthy diet all about? Okay, let me just share with you this um, healthy plate. This is called um, My Healthy Plate. It re replaces the healthy diet pyramid, which uh, we have probably seen before. It is um, a teaching tool that we use to teach our patients and our clients how to eat better. So if you were to look at this plate, you can see that a quarter of the plate it makes up whole grains. Uh, that includes brown rice, um, wholemeal bread. And the other quarter includes protein, which includes your meat and others. And the others here will be your dairy products uh, like milk, yogurt, um, eggs come here as well, seafood too. And the other half of the plate consists of fruit and vegetables. So um, in accordance to um, the uh, World Health Organization's recommendations, the Health Promotion Board has also adopted um, the Healthy Plate as a tool um, to teach people that um, they are to move towards a plant-based diet because a plant-based diet has consistently demonstrated that um, it can prevent many chronic diseases which are affecting uh, not just Singapore, but many parts of the world. And uh, uh, half a plate of um, fruits and vegetables here um, will not be difficult to achieve if we are mindful about how we can incorporate some of these into our diet. Okay, let me just focus on beetroot now. Beetroot will come under the fruit and vegetable group. So they are um, a type of root vegetable, also known as a red beet, a table beet, green beet, or just beet. So you can see that it is um, very rich and intense in purple. Yeah, and um, it is so intense in purple that sometimes when you handle this beetroot, your fingers get stained sometimes with the dye that comes from the, um, the beet itself. Um, in fact, vegetables like um, these are what we call the deep colored or purple um, vegetables, which are power packed with many antioxidants inside. And alluding to what Dr. Chan mentioned earlier on, the antioxidants here serve um, to mop up the free radicals that are uh, produced um, every day whenever we step out of the road, uh, step out of the house, 
we breathe in fumes from the car, we smoke, we take in sometimes inevitably food that may not be very good for us. Uh, all these things generate free radicals. Even you and I now sitting here breathing, talking, we generate free radicals. And the antioxidants that are present in fruit and vegetables actually help to mop up all these free radicals to prevent the free radicals from damaging the membrane of your brain, um, your heart, and um, the important organs in your body. So beetroot, it's a great source of antioxidant. It is also a good source of fiber, uh, folate, uh, manganese, which is a micronutrient, uh, potassium, iron, and vitamin C. Um, fruit and vegetables are very rich in potassium, and actually potassium is a very important micronutrient. It actually works in tandem with sodium, meaning to say that if you have a diet very rich in potassium, your sodium intake will definitely fall. That's why when people are diagnosed with hypertension, we recommend that they take lots of fruits and vegetables because we want you to increase your potassium levels. And when your potassium levels are increased, your sodium content or intake will naturally fall and that will result in a healthy blood pressure. Okay. So the, here are some benefits of beetroot. They help reduce blood pressure um, because of the presence of um, antioxidants. They uh, remove the plaque formation in the arteries, allowing your blood pressure to flow normally and, um, and smoothly. It keeps your heart in good shape. It prevents cancer because of the antioxidant properties. It prevents respiratory problems. It helps to take care of your eyes because of the, again, the antioxidants that will prevent the free radicals from damaging the retina of your eye. It increases your stamina. It helps to reduce birth defects. And the, um, the one that I would like to highlight to you is it prevents dementia. More and more research is focusing on beetroot and its importance in the prevention of dementia. Um, it also helps in the purification of blood and um, your liver, and also it helps to take care of your liver. The liver, it's a wonderful and amazing organ because it actually breaks down a lot of toxins that your body um, processes every day, uh, whether it's from pollution or from the food that we eat, or even from drugs, yeah, medicine, or even um, drugs which are not legal. So your liver really works very hard. And, and, and so um, beetroot has one of its benefits as well on protecting our liver. So let me just share with you very briefly the science behind beetroot and dementia. Um, there is a, a, a very good study um, that demonstrated that drinking beetroot actually increases the blood flow to the brain in older people, suggesting that this very dark red pigment that I was telling you about might fight the progression of dementia. Uh, and what is the important component or compound found in beetroot um, that actually helps um, to reduce the progression of dementia. And that is the high concentrations of nitrates present in beetroot, which are converted into nitrites by the bacteria in the mouth. So the bacteria in your mouth is not all bad. There is good bacteria in the mouth, in your gut, that actually helps to convert nitrates present in beetroot into nitrites. And these nitrites have a very important role to play. They open up the blood vessels in the body. And these blood vessels can be any blood vessel that could be leading up to your brain, that could be leading to your heart. And it actually increases the blood flow and oxygen to places that are lacking in oxygen. So for patients with dementia or early signs of um, uh, brain degeneration, um, they found that actually these patients have a very low oxygen perfusion into their brain. And for this reason, nitrites actually help to open up the blood vessels so that more oxygen can be transported um, to these areas which are lacking in oxygen. So basically, it just perfused the, the, the blood vessels and these areas lacking oxygen with um, oxygen so that your brain will be able to function um, better and more normally. Okay. So eating a high nitrate diet increases blood flow to the white matter of the frontal loop. So your brain has um, the white matter and uh, the, the gray matter. So the white matter in the frontal loop, right? It's the ones which is the area most associated with the degeneration that leads eventually to dementia and other cognitive con uh, conditions Dr. Chan mentioned earlier on. So uh, nitrates not only just found in beetroot, but also found in celery, cabbage, and other leafy green vegetables. So um, you can see why now the World Health Organization and Health Promotion Board promotes a plant-based diet for this reason as well. Okay. So um, 
So if you want to try beetroot, then a Reben horse is one which is 100% pure, unsweetened beetroot juice. Meaning to say that it's from purely from beet, it's got no added sugar. And so the sweetness from this juice comes primarily and wholly from the beetroot that they have used to extract to make into this bottled juice. Why I stress unsweetened? Because we do not want to um, gain the benefits of beetroot juice at the expense of taking excessive sugar. Because we know that a diet very rich in sugar or high in sugar predisposes you to obesity and subsequently um, diabetes. Okay. So very important to go for unsweetened juices because anything with uh, lots of sugar, added sugar inside would increase your blood sugar levels and cause your pancreas to re, uh, produce insulin in very high amounts. And this um, constant texting of your pancreas to produce insulin just to reduce sugar that comes through your body every day will tax your pancreas. And over time, your pancreas will break down. And that's how diabetes happens because your pancreas is not secreting insulin as much as it should. Yeah. So one cup a day is good. That's approximately 250 milks. Yeah. Go for juice, uh, beetroot juices with no concentrate, no added sugar, and no preservatives. So this is as fresh as you can get. So um, uh, earlier on, as to what Jenny has mentioned, um, they can be found in places which she has, uh, she has said earlier on, in Guardian, in, on Lazada, yeah, Red Mart. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so with that, I, I conclude my talk and I'll be happy to take any questions related to what I just shared or any other nutrition-related questions. Um, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Shaleen. For, actually, it's very insightful. Because of uh, diet, I am also realizing that, you know, I'm taking too much sugar. I've also, you know, uh, switched my diet as well. I mean, of mm. course, mixing with uh, all you doctors and nutritionists, you know, it really stresses, you know, me more. Um, <laughs> One question that came is, other than juicing, how to prepare mm. a meal from beetroot? Okay, there is one suggestion. You know, when I was doing up my slides, uh, I thought, okay, I like to cook uh, ABC soup for the family. So ABC soup, I'm sure you're familiar with, is the uh, carrots, potatoes, and onion um, soup, right? And one of the, the ways that, that you could incorporate um, beetroot is actually into ABC soup. So you can sometimes replace the carrot with beetroot, yeah, if you like. And um, it's, it's really good because it gives the soup a, a reddish color. Yeah. And it's very nutritious as well because you also get to drink the, 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 the soup and all the vitamins from beetroot will be, you know, in the soup. So one way it's actually um, in the soup form. The other way it's um, actually in a dessert. But of course, I recommend that you, if you are a home baker, um, you can do that because you can moderate the intake of sugar. Yeah, inside. So beetroot makes a very good beetroot pie, if you like. Yeah. Um, you can also, you know, um, just do a stir fry as well if you don't want to do juice. Yeah. So just take it like any um, root vegetable, like uh, whether it's a carrot or a white radish, you can treat beetroot um, as it is. But just be prepared that you will see a uh, red color. Okay. It's, um, it's, it's, it's okay. It's just the, the dye that comes from it. Okay. I think um, for a person like myself who's working, I really don't have the time to cook. Yes. So uh, a juice would uh, be more nutritional for me in this okay. instance. Okay, just one one glass of juice a day. So I was always telling parents and you know people in general that you it's very easy to just take fruit juice, but be very careful because the guideline is two servings of fruits a day. But you cannot say that, okay, I'm going to have two, two glasses of, of beetroot juice because don't forget, uh, we need the fiber as well. So regardless of the number of fruit juices that you drink, not just beetroot, can be any fruit juice, it will still be considered as one serving. That means that if I take one glass of beetroot juice already, my second fruit will be a whole fruit, whether it's an orange or whether it's a pineapple or a papaya. Okay, um, we've got a question here. Is it beneficial to one with thyroid uh, disease? You know, can they still take this? Thyroid disease. Um, yes, if you're on medication, um, you can certainly take a beetroot. It's a very neutral vegetable. Yeah. Likewise, for somebody who mentioned he's got low blood pressure, will some yes. beetroot hurt or affect? No. Yeah, it wouldn't. Yeah. Beetroot is it's actually very neutral. Yeah. Hmm. What about uh, taki? What about taki? What is taki? 
I don't Sorry, know what's Tucky. Uh, perhaps a person who asked, um, what's Tucky? Hmm. Um, is there any it, health condition which renders one unsuitable for cons consuming high concentration of beetroot? I think 250 mils is not high concentration, right? Yeah, that's fine. 250 is a standard serving for a fruit juice, whether it's beetroot or any other juices. Yeah. Mm. Um, uh, but, any, but I just want to highlight to you, I think what this person is referring to is excessive consumption because you think it's healthy, right? But I just want to um, highlight to you that anything, even though no matter how healthy it is, whether it is a packet of cashew nuts or uh, olive oil, for example, has all got to be taken in moderation. Because um, it is, uh, you know, it's everything has, there has to be a balance. Yeah. Okay. And it's also important for us to have a variety of um, different uh, foods and fruits, because that also exposes us to different kinds of antioxidants, different kinds of nutrients, because nutrients don't work um, in silos. Our nutrients work together in synergy with one another. Yeah. So it's very important for us, you know, to remember that. Yeah. Okay, that we have to take things uh, in combination. There was a question here, whether can someone eat the beetroot raw? Um, I don't think there's anything wrong taking it raw, but you know, it's a little bit like taking um, daikon or white radish or carrot raw, uh, unless you're used to it, because some people might find it a bit too hard or a bit too, um, how do I say, like sappy. Yeah, so um, again, it's personal preference, but you know something, I just want to share with you that not all raw vegetables are best. Why do I say this? Because uh, beetroot, for example, is very rich in vitamin A as well. And you know, vitamin A, it's very, it's a fat-loving um, vitamin. So your fat-loving vitamins are A, D, E, K. Now, these fat-loving vitamins would really appreciate if you stir fry it with a little bit of oil. Do you know why? Because it, it requires a bit of oil because it's fat-loving, right? It will attach itself to the oil and then it will be easily transported in the body for better absorption. So sometimes a salad may not be good all the time. If you have some lightly cooked vegetables in oil, it's perfectly fine too, okay? Okay, I think, um, Shalin, thank you so much. For some of the no questions problem. that we didn't manage to answer, we'll do it offline and we'll send you the answers. Yeah, no problem. Most of the of time, you know, I, I think yes. we have to move on because uh, yeah. we, we are a little bit behind. So thank yes. you. Thank you once again, you know, Shalin, for sharing no with problem. us. No problem. Yeah, thank you and, so much. Um, yeah. Good night. And good the night. Next yeah. we have is uh, our third speaker. Our third speaker is none other than uh, Mr. Peter Weishop to tell us why Raven Horse is the very best for us. Peter is the International Sales Director at Ravenhaus and is responsible for the international sales of the traditional juice manufacturer to over 40 countries. So let's watch a video from Ravenhaus before... Uh, In 1805, Father Laufs founded a vineyard that laid the foundation for the brand Rabenhorst. More than 120 years ago, Germany's first red grape juice was produced. By Rabenhorst, of course. Today, health is a global megatrend, but we at Rabenhorst have always known about the best of nature, and with our pure juices, we make a valuable contribution to a healthy diet. Important vitamins, minerals, and a genuine taste awaken inner strengths and sensibly improve the quality of life. Every day, we decide for the good, and our customers do the same for themselves, for others, and for the world around us. This is what drives us, what gives people vital energy, what we Germans call Lebenskraft. And you can taste and feel it in every sip. For over 200 years, we've been giving our best for the people and the environment. We follow our convictions, not trends. We are committed to the highest quality of ingredients, purchasing, processing, and bottling. Our customers and trading partners have relied on this for generations, in Germany and throughout the world. We give vital energy. Lebenskraft. Rabenhorst. Peter, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you for the introduction. It's more than the screen is mine, I think, than the stage. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Also, thank you, Mr. Chan and, and Cheryl for the for the very, very valuable information you gave already. I learned a lot. 
and uh, my part today is uh, um, telling a little bit uh, about Haas Rabenhorst, so the producer of uh, beetroot juice, among other juices we do. And uh, I mean, we, uh, we saw first video and I think pictures tell a thousand words. So um, I think um, it, the video shows already a little bit what we are doing and what drives Rabenhorst to, to, to what we are doing today. Besides the pictures, I would like just to, to pick up some, uh, some key words from the movie, which we just saw, um, because they really reflect uh, what, what Rabenhorst is doing for over 200 years. Um, the first word was pioneergeist, um, um, or, or yeah, pioneergeist, and uh, pioneergeist means uh, in English pioneering spirit. So uh, since the foundation of the family business in 1805, uh, the family stood always for the pioneering spirit, actually. And it started in 1805 uh, when, when the priest, uh, Mr. Heinrich Laus, founded a winery at the River Rhine. So we are based at the River Rhine. Uh, not far from Cologne, if you if you know Germany. So in 1898, already his great grandson Alexander, he starts producing a non-alcoholic medical natural wine. So it was already a start to uh, to a health food business um, at the end of the 19th century. And actually, at that time, uh, Louis Pasteur, the French scientist, invented the pasteurization process. And only from that time on, it was possible to use the grapes and not make wine of them by fermentation, but also to make juice. So the word juice was born at that time. In 1920, together with the, with the reform movement, House Rabenhorst advocates a healthy and natural diet. So you see, we have been always committed to healthy, healthy food in the past. And in 1952, not long after, after the Second World War, the sons, Alexander and Günther, uh, they introduced a, a, a juice called Rotbäckchen, which was the first healthy children juice in Germany. In 1969, uh, we started uh, already the controlled farming together with the University of Kassel in Germany. So we were also one of the pioneers of organic uh, production, organic produce and farming in Germany. So the next, the next key word we heard was tradition. And um, I mean, tradition is, you see German is quite, quite similar to English, is, is tradition, uh, is tradition in English. And the company has always been family owned since seven generations. Um, and hopefully will remain so for the next generations. Um, and what we do not see tradition as, as backward looking, we see it as an obligation uh, and also as a responsible for future generations. And that leads us to the, neck and, uh, to the next um, key word, which we, which we heard, Nachhaltigkeit. Nachhaltigkeit in English means sustainability, which is today a strong trend actually, but uh, we were a sustainability trend before it became one actually. And uh, as, as I said, we already started in 1969 with organic controlled uh, farming. Uh, this was also pioneering and uh, sustainable at that time. And we followed regular sustainability programs already since the middle of the 90s. We follow holistic corporate principles which are to protect habitats as comprehensively as possible, uh, to connect to the nature and to commit to, to humanity uh, to use raw material as pure as possible and to proceed the products as natural as products uh, as possible too. And um, um, a next key point and the key word which we heard was Erfahrung aus Tradition, which means nothing else than experience by tradition. Uh, we have been producing juices since, as I said, end of the 19th century. Uh, and we were certainly one of the first producers of juices in the world over 120 years ago. We have gained a lot of experience in juice production and we've made for sure a lot of mistakes and, and continue to learn from eliminating them. Um, we heard about Überzeugung, which means conviction, and we are convinced about what, what we are doing for generations already. So we follow our company philosophy and strive for the, most, for the best possible quality uh, to our consumers worldwide. And we are open for new trends at the same time, but we always try to align new trends to unrestricted quality policy. And, this leads us to the point of uh, Bewusstsein and Verantwortung, meaning consciousness and responsibility, which is more and more important in our today's world, because we are con uh, con conscious uh, of our history and values 200 years ago, and we anchored them also in our corporate values, quality, sustainability, credibility, community, experience from tradition, and the power of ch change and well-being, of course. In order to maintain these values, we see ourselves as having a responsibility to, to the environment 
our family st uh, shareholders, our employees, our partners and the supply chains, the consumers, and also the generations to come. But really the, the, the key point is what we are doing is quality. Quality is uh, qualität, which we heard, which we did from and which we followed from the very beginning. Um, it is a clear commitment of to quality what we are doing and we try to yeah we try we try to proceed it in every product we uh, we, we bring to the market and to our consumers um, as a clue point um, and in a nutshell what makes Rabenhaus maybe different from other juice producers is over 120 years of experience in in, in direct juices and pure juices we use only the best ingredients which is important to guarantee the quality we do the in-house pressing, so we, we have a, a own pressing and control the quality from the start. Uh, we only use um, direct juices, never made from concentrates. Sherilyn already uh, mentioned it uh, um, in her speech before. We have very strict quality controls and uh, we, our fillings are particularly gentle so that the natural structure and valuable ingredients are preserved as good as possible. So that's about uh, the history and the heritage we had. Maybe we go to the next slide. Um, and I would like to, uh, to continue a little bit. What, what, what is the competence uh, of Robin Horst? It is, as I said, the doing of, of pure juices instead of making juices from concentrates. We have a really broad portfolio of over 60 different juices and, and juice compositions. And uh, the core competence is, uh, is a pure juice, such as beetroot, pomegranate, blueberry, cherry, aronia. Some of them you will also find in, in the before mentioned um, outlets or online, offline in, in the Singapore market, uh, thanks to the great distribution work of, um, of our partner, uh, Matrix Star, uh, for, for some years already. Thank you also for that. Among those, actually, Bitru is one of the best-selling items of our assortment, not only in the domestic German market, but also in the most of the international market. So it's one of the most renowned and most international products we have, we have in our portfolio. All the juices are direct juices. We call them mother juices sometimes, and they have in common, uh, in common just that they are consist of 100% only juices without any preservatives, additives, colorants, and they are never made from, from concentrates. Next slide, please. So what makes uh, beetroot so different? Uh, a little, a little uh, big uh, to the history, but Shirley had already uh, gave her a short uh, in, uh, overview about that. Beetroot, Betos, uh, Beta vulgaris in the Latin name. Uh, the origin is the Middle East, which I, which I read on Wikipedia. It came then to the Mediterranean region and was brought to the, by the Romans also to Middle Europe. Uh, the good thing is for beetroot that it can be cultivated in several climate region, regions, so it's quite easy to, to cultivate uh, uh, the root. It is used already 2000 years ago as, as well as for food source, but also as a cure remedy. As Shalian already pointed out, contains many vitamins, minerals and secondary plant substances, a lot of antioxidants, which are so important in today's uh, nutrition. Um, and the highlights uh, I, I, I underline again is, is folic acid, where the beetroot is rich in is iron, is potassium, and is betaine, which also gives a very red color, uh, and nitrate, which is uh, important for the regulation of the blood pressure. Next slide, please. So beetroot is not only healthy, as we heard uh, in the previous uh, speeches and talks, it's, it, it's also tasted. So it can be really used perfectly also for a uh, for versatile kitchen. Uh, even if you do a salad or if you cook it, um, it you, can, you can use it for baking. You can make it for using bread. Uh, we have also a little leaflet with some recipes about that. And actually, you can also refine some of the food with, uh, with the Robin Horse juice if you want, don't want to handle or if you don't want to use it fresh. So it's really also useful for using the juice, not for drinking it, but also to using it for, um, for cooking. Next slide. So what makes uh, our juice uh, special? So 100% pure juice, as I said, but the 100% are not only uh, the beetroot. We have also 4% of organic lemon inside, and this is uh, basically to, uh, to influence also a little bit the, the pH value uh, uh, of the juice. It gives, of course, a certain freshness to, freshness 
and also stability to the to the beetroot juice. Uh, this is why we use a little dash of organic uh, lemon juice in it. Not made from concentrates, I repeat myself. Uh, the beetroot we, uh, we use and we proceed are from German organic cultivation. The sowing is in spring, so uh, we'll be starting in, uh, in a month or two. We are, we are still here in a little bit cold weather in Germany. Sun is shining today when I look out the, cinder, uh, the window, but this morning we still had two degrees. And I'm really looking and longing for going back to Singapore as soon as, soon as possible. <laughs> um, we do contract cultivation uh, with selected organic farmers in Germany. So we actually know where, where, the, where the beetroots and also other fruits we proceed are coming from. The taste, uh, the sensoric side, uh, also Sherlin mentioned it a little bit. It is kind of sweetish, but without adding sugar, it has a certain, yeah, strong earthy and pity, uh, pity, uh, it's a very special beetroot taste. And so immediately after harvesting, after harvesting, the beetroots are carefully processed in our facilities and uh, gently bottled in the Rabenhorst facilities in the brown glass bottle, which we also see on the slide here. We use a brown glass, by the way, the glass be because it gives a, a, a long shelf life. It's really stable. It can last uh, up to two years, which is a, a shelf life we have, which is good also for export activities. And the brown glass, of course, uh, protects the, the content uh, against the UV light. We have a yearly production of around two, uh, 400 tons of beetroot juice. And uh, we recommend, as Sherlin also said, not, not like a full bottle or uh, two glasses. We really suggest also to drink one glass, which is one portion of the fruit, uh, which is suggested also by by the um, uh, WHO. Uh, and this is what we actually also recommend. Last, next slide, please. Should, should be more or less the, the last one. It's about a little bit the, the selling side. Uh, as I said before, um, the beetroot juice is, is, is really in, in most of our countries, we, uh, we distribute not only in Germany, we sell it to over 25 countries worldwide. You see some of the labels in Greek language and in Swedish and Finnish language and in German and in what else we have French and uh, Netherlands. It shows that we, uh, which we sell it in all of these countries with a with a special label, and uh, also the export shares over fifty percent. So it's a very international product and probably one of the most international products and loved by many many people in the world. I think that was it. If you go yes, to the next. Yes, thank you. Slide. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very thank much you, for Peter. your attention. I, I just want to have got one burning question. I know you've got the proprietary glass, you know, that is entered, but it is, you know, I just want to know how many beetroot, you know, uh, is needed to make a border of beetroot juice. Oh, that is a good question. I'm actually, I'm, 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 I'm not prepared uh, to be honest, but I would, would rather help you. I don't want to say something wrong. Hmm. Um, uh, so I, I can follow up. Uh, okay, you... follow that up because, you know, I hmm. believe, you know, um, drinking, why I ask that is that drinking the beetroot juice would give us a lot more nutrients as compared to eating it because, you know, normally the, the nutrients in one glass, it's way higher than what if I eat in one fruit, right? Exactly, exactly that is. But on the other hand, going back to, to Sherlin's also, it, it is also um, that... It is more so you don't need to, to drink so much, but it's also important not to drink too much juice and not to eat the fresh fruit or vegetables because of the lacking fibers, actually. So we, we really uh, are completely behind what Sherlin said already, and uh, uh, the doses is always uh, what makes it good or not so good. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's really uh, good to know that, you know, com companies like Ravenhorst would not just ask people to drink more juice because you want to sell more product, but you would regulate the correct amount for people to drink so that they get the best benefit out of the bottle. Thank you, yep. Peter. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Um, next, I think, you know, you would really have this session that everybody is waiting for. We will now do a quiz segment with four questions. And... There's four questions, you know, if you have actually been listening, you know, attentively, you would be able to answer them. Um, this is a special Raven Horse gift pack worth $50 sponsored by Raven Horse and Matrix Stars. And fastest finger first for the quiz. And you would be able to walk away with one of these prizes. And I'm looking at four unique winners, meaning that if you have won question one, 
then you would not be uh, winning question two, even if you were the fastest finger. Okay, now let me go. Um, but question one, as I said, if you have listened to Dr. Chan, you would have no issue answering. Give one symptom of dementia mentioned by Dr. Chan. Tap into the chat box quickly. I see answers coming in. I've got 11 of them, 12 of them. I'm asking for one symptom of dementia. Okay. Only 20 people answered. What about the rest of the 100 people? You've got 120 people in this room. Okay. Question two. Just to test how good, you know, it's uh, whether you've been listening to the talk and whether it's good for you. What is the key component in beetroot that may slow down the progression of dementia? Okay, coming in, coming in, coming in, good. Thank you. Let me move on to question three. Name three places online or offline where you can buy Ravenhorst pure juice from. Three, yeah? you've got to mention three. If you just mention one, I want three places from the list I've given you. Three places. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your participation. We've got about more than a hundred uh, answers, you know, in the board already. I'm missing count. My last question, which is a bonus question, the last question is really, really bonus. You just answer with through or first. Is Ravenhorst beetroot juice certified organic? Wow, thank you. That's amazing. All of you are really, really fast. Okay, while waiting for my colleague to tabulate the winner's list, uh, you may want to scan the this barcode or link, you know, online here. As Maastricht Star has nicely agreed, you know, to offer all participants an exclusive 20% discount. You know, you can scan the QR code or click onto the link sent in the chat box at the bottom of your screen to retrieve, you know, to retrieve it. This offer is actually valid till March. So have you all actually whipped up your phone to, you know, um, capture the shopping code? My colleagues are still tabulating. I think they are just running, 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 you know, with the things. So I am waiting for the results to come in because I am, you know, on this screen with you. So I'm not, you know, um, assessing the chat box. Okay, now we've got the answers to uh, question one. Fastest fingers first. Question one, David So, you got it correct. David So, congratulations. The second question is Julie Poon. And then the third person, it's rating who's got all the um, answers right where, where you can find Raven Horse juices. NTUC Finest, Extra, Shopee, Red Mart, Guardian, Guardian Online. So just to name a few, Lazada. So that, you know, if you've missed them, these are the places that you can get Raven Horse juices. And the last person to get the answer right is Tan Yen Kim. Yen Kim, all four of you, we will be contacting you, you know, to let you know how can you collect your prizes. So, um, Andrea, can you put on, can you off the screen so that I could talk? Thank you all. Um, 
We have still people coming in at this hour. Okay. Thank you all for actually joining us. This program is actually only this uh, made available and made possible by our very, very good sponsor, Raven Horse, and its marketing company, Metric Star. Otherwise, you know, we would not be able to get Dr. Chan as well as uh, Shalene to come and share this with all of us. So um, can we give, you know, a thank you to our sponsors, please? Maybe y'all could unmute and chat or y'all could uh, even, you know, type in the chat box. So for somebody who's actually asked me, you know, how can she get the YouTube link? We would be, you know, um, cleaning up this uh, recording and we will be putting it onto our YouTube channel. Uh, our YouTube channel is Prime Magazine as you know earlier, but we will also reply you in your email that you've registered, you know, how you have registered it. We will re-email you again to give you the link to watch this. And you can always share with your loved ones, you know, how good Raven Horse has been for you and how it can actually help you. If you've got other questions that you would want to post in, do still send through, or if not, if you don't, if you miss this link, you can actually send it, you know, to our email and uh, we could still post it to the, to the different speakers and have it you know addressed to you and uh, if you want to unmute because uh, i think most of us are already off uh you can unmute yourself and uh, ask me any questions if you want otherwise for people who want to drop off i can totally understand good night and uh, thanks for your patience we've overrun a little bit but nonetheless for such an uh, insightful um session i'm very sure everybody would be very comfortable staying on to know and be empowered how to take care of their own health and their own uh, mind uh, status of their, you know, uh, mind brain health, I would say. <laughs>